Hi, welcome back. I'm your host, Dr. Wendy Bingham from Extra Pelvic Not Rare. Today's lesson looks at the question, is extra pelvic endometriosis rare? We will provide examples of factors that affect our ability to determine how rare it really is. We also take a look at current literature estimates of the more common locations of extra pelvic disease. Let's get started. Let's get started. We begin lesson two with the question, is extra pelvic endometriosis rare? Without a number or percentage value to quantify the term, use of the word rare must be interpreted carefully. Here, we provide four of the most frequent body systems affected by the endometriosis lesions. Note the wide range of prevalence among each of them. If the lowest percentage was considered among each of these, would you consider this rare? Would you consider the highest percentages reported among each of these systems as rare? What are some factors that impact the ability to determine exactly how rare or unrare extrapelvic endometriosis is? We have highlighted a few factors currently impairing our awareness for real distribution of endometriosis among the body systems and prevalence in persons across the globe. Any attempt to understand the disease is incomplete without full representation of the entire disease spectrum. The first and second factor focus on professional education, both didactic and clinical. The opportunity to learn accurate, detailed information about the various theories of how endometriosis begins and evolves, the medical and surgical interventions that are available, as well as signs and symptoms of pelvic disease and, lest we include extra pelvic endometriosis, is absent in the medical and allied health professional training programs. Unfortunately, most programs provide a very cursory overview about endometriosis, which is still centered around Samson's theory of retrograde menstruation from 1927. Thus, nearly 100 years later, perhaps it's time we expand information presented to include other models of origins, the evolution of lesions, tissue composition, as well as the color changes with age and growth. Lastly, and most importantly, the reality that the disease is not confined to the female reproductive system or pelvis. As an intern or resident, exposure to the disease is often impacted by the experience and education of the attendees. Unlike passing down family traditions, progress in the area of endometriosis is negatively impacted when older and more experienced clinicians pass on knowledge and treatments that are outdated. Licensed providers and practitioners have very limited opportunities to learn more about endometriosis. With an estimated 10% of cis females to have endometriosis and the possibility that non-reproductive body symptoms may also incur the disease, there should be greater opportunity, regardless of specialty, to advance the knowledge for this disease. In particular, the signs and symptoms as they may relate to their specialty, as well as consideration of the disease during screening examinations. Research is vital to advance our understanding of the disease and develop progressive treatments. To date, the majority of research that's published is derived from large university hospitals or through financial supports with government grants or private corporations. Interest in extrapelvic endometriosis is slowly gaining space in publication. A lack of awareness by way of insufficient curriculum and an absence of universal recording for all areas of disease are influencers to where funding is directed. There is little incentive for private special interest corporations to fund epidemiology studies. Despite a lack of funding of opportunities, data is still being collected and published. 
Without standardized guidelines to conduct research, studies are usually limited by location, the type of facility, the experience of the surgical team, and even criteria for the tissue samples collected. This makes it difficult to delineate if the data collected can be applied to the global population. In addition, the quantity of research collected about extrapelvic endometriosis is limited simply by the lack of specialists familiar with extrapelvic endometriosis. The number of surgical teams available worldwide who recognize and can excise lesions from all systems of the body are in very short supply. Those who know the disease best see extrapelvic disease regularly, but they're so busy treating those with the disease now, unless supported in a large teaching hospital, there is little support and time for publication. As mentioned earlier, there is no universal recording system to document endometriosis across all areas of the body. However, since 1948, the World Health Organization established a system to monitor health diseases and dysfunctions. This system is used in 117 countries today. The system is known as the International Classification of Diseases and Health-Related Problems, or ICD for short. Endometriosis is a disease included in this system. Unfortunately, as of 2020, the ability to record specific locations of endometriosis is limited. Let's take a look at the 10th version of the ICD. Endometriosis is placed in Chapter 14. It is classified as a disease of the female genitourinary system. There are both inflammatory and non-inflammatory disorders. Curiously, endometriosis is classified as a non-inflammatory disorder. Hmm. Now let's take a look at what areas of endometriosis are included in this 10th version of the ICD. As you can see, areas of pelvic endometriosis are included. After all, it is traditionally perceived as a female reproductive disease. Note the areas in bold. These are areas of extrapelvic endometriosis. Inclusion of extrapelvic locations within the ICD system is helpful for tracking prevalence. However, if its inclusion in the system is based upon estimated prevalence, then A, some of these locations should not be listed while other more common areas are not, and B, each of the listed areas have concerns associated with their listings. Let me explain more in the next slide. The first extra pelvic location, the rectovaginal septum and vagina are appropriately included here. The second area, the intestines, is considered as the most common location for extra pelvic disease. Its inclusion in the ICD system is also appropriate. The fact the intestinal tract has many regions and that disease is encountered in numerous organs of the digestive system, perhaps an option for greater detail by region and or by organ and region of the digestive system should be considered. The third area, cutaneous scar. There are a few concerns with this listing. A, this item excludes endometriosis of the skin in areas that are undisturbed for prior surgery. It is commonly believed that scar endometriosis occurs as a result of transplanted uterine tissue through surgical procedures. This is also referred to as secondary endometriosis. Endometriosis lesions can also be found on skin that has never undergone any surgical procedures. This is naturally occurring and spontaneous, it is also known as primary skin endometriosis. To date, it is estimated that secondary cutaneous endometriosis is more common than primary endometriosis of the skin. However, shouldn't this also be included? The question must also be asked, is secondary and primary endometriosis of the skin the same disease? Unfortunately, I can't see if any hands have gone up in the audience, but I'm sure many of you are already asking, well, where's the bladder? A ureter, a diaphragm, muscle, peripheral nerve, liver, any other organs and tissues listed? All these and many more are clumped together and known as other. You could say there's a whole lot of other going on. 
Let's go back to the purpose of this lesson. Is extrapelvic endometriosis rare? After presenting a few factors that impact the ability to recognize the signs and symptoms of the disease among the body systems, its limitations of imaging, as well as the limited understanding and awareness of its colors and forms of presentation, plus the lack of widespread standardized data collection and investigation guidelines, the question of rarity cannot be answered. What can be considered is the likelihood a higher prevalence of extrapelvic endometriosis is present among the global population than we perceive. Let me explain. It cannot be ignored that much extrapelvic endometriosis is misdiagnosed, undiagnosed, or the person with the disease is dismissed of any physical malady. A recent review article gathered data from publications over the last 10 years regarding extrapelvic endometriosis. These included case and group studies. Despite emission of some more frequent locations of extrapelvic disease, as well as limiting the parameters of the study information collected based on their numbers and size, they conclude extrapelvic endometriosis may not be that rare after all. The authors of this review propose that surgical centers who treat a high volume of endometriosis cases, many with lesions among various body systems, should be members of a central registry to collect data of all disease in all areas. This is a great idea to start, but doesn't address the fact that many women with endometriosis, particularly extrapelvic disease, do not reach multidisciplinary endometriosis specialty excision centers. Given the reality that a portion of persons with extrapelvic endometriosis are treated for disease by specialists other than gynecologists, it's imperative a global recording system is in use by all practitioners and providers. Otherwise, the prevalence will remain as underestimations. Some of the providers those with extrapelvic endometriosis seek care from include general practitioners, pediatricians, internists, urologists, gastroenterologists, cardiothoracic, dermatology, neurology. It is not uncommon for these persons and their care teams to miss the association of their symptoms with their menstrual cycles. Some may not even have common symptoms of heavy, painful menstrual cycles suggested of concurrent pelvic endometriosis. Before reflexively using the word rare to represent extra pelvic endometriosis, please consider using some of the alternative words for example, atypical, infrequent, less common. Although some locations of extrapelvic disease truly are rare, occurring a handful of times, many locations are reported on a regular basis. Rare is not representative of all disease. Given the barriers of poor awareness, inadequate professional education and clinical experience, that's necessary to identify the signs and symptoms suggestive of endometriosis among the various bodies, we must realize only a portion of these individuals are accurately diagnosed and receive treatment for body-wide disease. The reality remains, there are many who are undiagnosed, misdiagnosed, or dismissed of disease. The question is, just how many, and will they be counted? Thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at Lesson 3, Where Has Endometriosis Been Found in the Body? Until then, we wish wellness to you all. Goodbye.